And good morning once again. Welcome to the Baptist Voice. I am your host this morning, Pastor Joseph Hart, the pastor of the Bible Baptist Church. We're thankful that you have tuned in this morning. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome to the Baptist Voice. To those who listen on a weekly basis, welcome to the program this morning. We're glad that you're with us. We pray that you've had a great past week. We pray that you had a good Easter. You know, typically Easter is a time when everybody gets together and meets at someone's church. Typically those who are not in church will meet at whoever is going to church. They'll they'll meet there. And then after services, they go to someone's house and there is a pitch-in lunch or someone prepares a lunch or a dinner and you spend time fellowshipping together. And I think it's just wonderful. Matter of fact, I think we ought to do it once a month. I think it ought to be done on a regular basis. We're so busy today. As a people, we forget to spend quality time first and foremost with God in church, but then second with our family, our church family, and it's just a wonderful thing. And I pray that it was a a great time for you and your family as you celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the way, you know, every year when Easter is about to come or post-Easter after it's came, You hear all these people start talking about Easter's a pagan festival. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Let let me just very clearly set the record straight on this. This does not need to be complex at all. The word Easter in your King James Bible, which is the Bible, all the other English translations, I would not even... I would not even open up and read because they have been taken away from, they have been perverted, they have been changed, and God says you ought not to do that to his word. And the fact of the matter is there's a warning, several warnings throughout scripture that if we take away from the word of God, God's going to take something away from us. I wouldn't mess with that. But in the King James Bible, in the book of Acts, the word Easter is found Easter. The word Easter in the book of Acts refers to the word Passover. Now, the word Passover and Passover itself is a Jewish festival that is held every year, and it goes back and has its beginnings, first rule of mention, with Moses when he was in the land of Egypt. And uh, after he had confronted Pharaoh so many times about letting the people go, and which Pharaoh said, no, I am not letting the people go. Well, God told Moses, you're going to go one more time, and this will be the last time. And it was. And God told Moses to tell Pharaoh that if Pharaoh did not let Israel go from Egypt, that they may go three days journey into the wilderness to worship and to serve God that God would visit the land of Egypt with judgment. Okay, it's a real simple story. You've learned this in, in Sunday school. So you know that Moses told the Israelites to take a lamb, a male lamb of the first year without spot, without blemish, and uh, to take that lamb and to uh, slay him, take the blood of that lamb and Put it upon the outside of the home in which you lived in. So, in other words, they would take, in our terms, a plant, but that would be act like a paintbrush, and they would dip it in that blood of that lamb, that innocent lamb, and they would put it on top of their doorpost outside their home and on the sides. And then they was to take the lamb, they was to roast it with fire, they were to eat it with bitter herbs, and that night, God himself said he was going to come through the land of Egypt, and he was going to judge the Egyptians because of their unbelief. And wherever, wherever God did not see that blood applied to the outside of the home, he was going to enter in, and the judgment that God would particularly be exercising would be the death of the firstborns. Now, that was throughout all the land of of many types, not just human beings, but that was throughout all the land dealing with other things as well. Now, with that in mind, when God seen the blood on the outside of the door, which meant that that individually uh, that individual and that that in, that family uh, exercised faith in the prescribed word of God. God passed over them and they were saved. Life was given to them. And we know that that night there was a great cry in the land of Egypt and God did just like he said he was going to do. And then Pharaoh told Moses, he said, go, 
leave. And they left, and there's more to the story than that, but that's, that's the word Passover. Now, that lamb, watch this. That lamb later on developed into the Passover from that particular um, story and that particular event with Moses and the Israelites while in the land of Egypt. Then later on, it got instituted a little bit more. The Day of Atonement, the Passover, to where the lamb met a substitutionary lamb or a sacrificial lamb. And there was actually two. One lamb was slain for the sins of the people, and the other uh, lamb, goat, let's use the term goat, um, was a scapegoat. And the, the priest would lay his hands on a scapegoat, and he would confess the sins of the people, and they would take that goat out into the wilderness by a fit man, and they would put a bell on his neck uh later on in history, and they would let that goat go, and that goat would just wander out away, and no one knew where to, and it was a picture, a twofold picture. The lamb that died was a picture of Christ dying for our sin, okay? We know the Bible teaches that Jesus died for our sin, was buried, and on the third day rose again. When he buried, he buried our sins. He carried our sins away so that we could have life. So that lamb that was slain was a picture of Christ who was slain on the cross. He was buried and then he was resurrected. And that lamb or that goat, that scapegoat as it's called, that was alive and was let out into the wilderness and was let loose that's a picture of our sins being put away from us, being carried away from us so that we can have newness of life. And newness of life cannot happen in biblical Christianity except for resurrection. The Bible says he was raised for our justification. So, you know, I'm not talking, by the way, about Easter bunnies and eggs, and I'm not talking nothing about that. I have nothing to do with that. I'm just saying there's there's a lot of people who say Easter is pagan. Easter means Passover. Passover goes back to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus points toward the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus points to the Gospels with uh, Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. The Gospels point toward the church epistles, which get full revelation of this. When people say that Easter is pagan, they're simply lacking a Bible knowledge of what the whole thought of Easter or Passover is. So Easter is a biblical word. It means Passover, and there's more to the Passover than death. There is life. Okay, just wanted to mention that so in case some smart aleck comes to buy you and asks you if you were in church last week and they laugh at you and, and they tell you you are doing pagan things, ask them what they're doing. <laughs> ask them what kind of pagan things they're involved in. But anyway, let, let's end that. And I just wanted to mention that because this past week, I know some people got confronted about this and and uh, maybe you will as well. So let's give a post Easter message. Up to today, we last Sunday gave a uh, resurrection Easter message. And up to that, we had two weeks, I believe, of preaching pre-Easter. Well, let's give a post-Easter message. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's talk about it. Romans chapter 6. Let's look today at the first, oh, I don't know. Let's look at the first maybe 11 verses. Romans chapter number 6. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what Paul says here to the church at Rome, which was written around AD 60. Here we go, verse 1. But what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we? that are dead to sin, live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism in the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness, it, excuse me, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this first, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, 
Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. In that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, last week we had our Easter celebration, our Passover pointed toward the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ celebration. We commemorate and we acknowledge that we serve a risen Lord. Although the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a past event, it stands for a current example for the world and in particular, the Christian believer. I want to say that again. Although the resurrection of Jesus Christ is past and he is alive, it stands for a current, a right now example for the world. And in particular, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So last week, I pray you went to church and I suppose the churches across America were full. I don't know for sure. Uh, I know at the Bible Baptist Church, we had a few seats available, but not many. Uh, We had a full nursery. Our primary church was full, and our church was full. The parking lot was overflowed, and we just want to thank the Lord. We had a, uh, I'm thankful everybody that came out. We had a great service. We talked about the seed and the body and the resurrection and the seed of Christ needing to be in us and our body so that when we die, that seed of Christ can bring forth a new body. We had a great time. And our visitors, I'm so thankful, all of our visitors that came. Uh, It's just a blessing to meet new people and husbands and wives and their children. And we just had a great time. I mean, it was, I'm, but what I'm getting at is this again. I I, I, want to see this this Sunday. So Easter's past. What now? Let's do it again this Sunday. Let's do it again. And what I'm what I'm trying to say is this: Now that Easter is over, and we have a little bit of explanation about a risen Savior, a little bit more knowledge, we're equipped mentally uh, with a little bit more of the understanding of the resurrection. Let's move on. Let's let's go back to church this Sunday, and let's go back to church the following Sunday, and let's make church part of our life unless we're providentially hindered. Let's make our mind up, husbands and wives, that we're, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. So what does this mean, though? Should we continue going to church? Sure. We're told in the book of Hebrews we're not to miss church at all. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, I'm going to tell you, in America, you can't blame a lot of people for not wanting to be in church and laughing at church. Charlatans, a lot of false prophecy, a lot of false prophets, a lot of false preaching. Sinner people, sinners, good sinners can see right through that nonsense. And there's a lot of people in the world who in the name of Jesus Christ have destroyed the pureness of Christianity by their wiles. Now, we're not into none of that. We're into preaching Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and risen from the grave. And other than that, if we glory in anything else, we're not interested. We're interested in glorifying Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his goodness in our lives. So now that Easter is past, what should we do? What's the thought here? Well, one thing about resurrection, that is the resurrection doctrine, and particular, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 7, is that Jesus died for your sin. Jesus was buried in a grave, and on the third day, Jesus rose again, and he is alive right now, seated on the right hand of God the Father. Okay, what does this mean now that Easter has passed? It means, first of all, number one, that you do not continue in sin. If you are a believer, and you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have been born again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that you do not continue in sin. Did you hear what Paul said in verses 1 and 2? What shall we say then? Shall we con- shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now watch this. How shall we that are dead to sin 
live any longer therein. You hear about the death, dead to sin, and then life. We're talking about death and resurrection. When the child of God becomes such, he becomes such by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he, that is the child of God, dies and gets the life of Christ, and yet he lives, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He says, and let me quote that verse to you. Maybe this will bring a little bit of a understanding to this thought about what we're trying to accomplish today. Paul said, now being alive, I am crucified with Christ. So Paul is saying he died with Christ and Christ died for our sins as a substitute. And Paul accepted that. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins then you, and you've accepted that, then you too can say, I am crucified with Christ. I accept what Jesus did. He died in my place. Okay. I am crucified with Christ. Now watch this though. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it involves the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and yet the living of Christ. And for the Christian, it involves that we have died to sin. We Our sins were nailed to the cross. Jesus died in our place. It's a substitutionary death. He literally did die for me. I was crucified with him. And now, since he's risen, I've risen with him. The spirit that raised him up from the dead lives in me to quicken me as well. He, First of all, for salvation, but yet he'll quicken me. And eventually, if I die, he'll quicken my body and I'll be raised just like Christ was raised if the rapture doesn't happen first. So we don't continue in sin. Jesus died for your sin so that you can be free from your sin. That is free from its destructive power. And dear friend, you make no mistake about it. Sin will manipulate you, deceive you, lie to you, and then it will destroy you. It'll destroy. Sin is in the business of destroying lives, and it doesn't matter whose life it is. Jesus died so that you could be free from that current type of destructive, that destructive power of sin, and in the future, sin's eternal wage. Well, what is the eternal wage of sin? The Bible says it's a tormented death in the lake of fire called hell. And and so Jesus died for your sins so that you can be pardoned from the destructive power of sin and that you can be pardoned from the eternal wage of sin, which is separation from God in the lake of fire, hell. So as the Christian, we don't continue in sin. And if I'm talking to you and you indeed are a Christian and you're living in sin, you are walking on thin ice. And I'm going to warn you, it's going to break. You need to stop you need to repent and you need to think this thing through clearly before it's too late. Because if you fall through broken ice, you may not come back up. And I'm just giving you the reality of the situation. This happens all the time. As, as Christ has died for our sin, was buried in the grave, and on the third day he rose again, and we accept that as our atonement, we do not from that time forward continue in sin. So we ought not to go to church just on Easter. We ought to be back this morning. We ought to be back next Sunday morning if the Lord allows that to happen. We do not continue in sin. This is what resurrection means. It means we live live a life unto God, which, let's look at it a little bit further, we have been identified with Jesus Christ by public baptism. Now, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He was deep water baptized. He was around 30 years old when he was baptized, okay? Uh, Jesus gave the church that he started during his earthly ministry, and let me say something about churches today. Churches start churches. When there is a so-called church that wasn't started by a church, it's illegitimate. And most of the time, I'm just going to say it, no one else will. 
Most of the time, when you find somebody who doesn't have church authority over them to start them or to help them or to moderate them or to look over them, you do not find any type of authority. God invested his authority in a local New Testament church, which is a called out assembly with a pastor, with a deacon, and with a membership. If there is not that for a church to start, that church is illegitimate and has never been connected to the umbilical cord of a church. And when that church um, figures this thing out, typically um, it, it could be a matter of going back and readjusting that, but typically they, they, they scoff at that and they say, well, that's just the opinion. No, churches start, churches start churches. Men don't start churches. Churches do. I was started out of the Bible Baptist Church of Mount Orb, Ohio. I could not come over here and start a church just by myself. I could have done that, but that's not biblical. That's not right. And that will not have the blessing of God upon it. And typically, when you find such churches, they are so watered down, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how unbiblical they are and their structure, and they just about got to be in order for anybody to come. And I want to get off of that subject, but I, I say that for this reason, baptism. Baptism is a church ordinance. It is trusted to a local New Testament church. It is something that Jesus Christ trusts to his church. Now, I'm going to say this again. Once we have been saved Um, we have accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as our atonement for sin. We have repented toward our sin and acknowledged the the destruction of it, and we don't want that. Uh, Then we identify with Christ publicly by believer's baptism, which is to be exercised by the authority of, of a local New Testament church. Now, we're a Baptist church. We say that on purpose. We believe in Baptist doctrine. We believe in Baptist teaching. We do not believe in other denominational teachings. We're not saying we're the only ones. That's not at all what we're saying. But there's a lot of teachings in other denominations that are not biblical. And the fact of the matter is, somebody may say, well, pastor, your teachings aren't biblical. Which one? Which one? We have 21 articles of faith, and I am 100% totally confident that every one of them can be supported without argument. I'm 100% confident. And so baptism, we have been identified with Jesus Christ by public baptism. And that's what Paul is telling the church at Rome. Okay. Verses number three, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism in the death that Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So, once you have been saved, you should make a public profession of your faith to a local, assembled, organized body of believers. Okay, baptism is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. The Baptist, we we do not believe in sprinkling. Sprinkling is nowhere found in the Bible at all. That's a man-made way. Baptism means to dip, plunge, or immerse, fully immerse. So the baptism tank that we have comes up to about the belly of an individual, all right? That's a picture of a grave, Baptism is a picture of a grave. That's a picture of a watery grave. And when a person gets baptized, they are giving publicly a picture of what they believe in their heart. They go down in the water, they're buried. They come out of the water, they're raised like Christ was raised from the grave. Baptism's a picture of the gospel and you are expressing outwardly to people what you believe inwardly. Years ago, I had a man, and I think it was his wife, I don't know, and and she had a teenage boy, and I went, and they got saved, or they made a profession of saved, and I went to talk to him about baptism, and the, and the boy said, well, I was baptized in the palm back here. And I said, well, who baptized you? And this gentleman, um, uh, he said, I baptized him. And I didn't want to argue with the guy because he was off on a lot of doctrine, and that's proven itself over the years. Uh, but that's that's a different story, and that's not something for me to harp on. But what I told that boy, I said, well, what church was you baptized into? Who 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 witnessed this as a church? 
And I, you know, this guy didn't have no authority to do that, but, you know, it's a picture of you with other believers expressing under an organized body of, of authority the picture of the gospel. Baptism is a picture of the gospel. Baptism is a picture of you putting off yourself to death. When you go down on the water, it's a picture of you making a public declaration that you are dying to self. And when you're raised out of the water, it's a picture of you making a public profession to a church that you're going to walk in newness of life as Christ resurrected. Baptism is the first believer's ordinance to follow after and is necessary for church membership. When a person is baptized, they're doing this in a local New Testament church. They're doing it in front of the church. They're showing the church they have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're showing the church that they're dying to their self. They're buried. They're showing the church they're being raised up. They're coming up out of the water to walk in newness of life as a new creature. And by their profession of faith, the church says, we will accept you into us as a membership. That's what baptism is. So baptism is clearly a thought and a doctrine that deals with the identification with Jesus Christ by public baptism. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Don't you know that you've been buried with him by baptism on the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Which leads us to our third thought. We have been raised to walk in newness of life. And this is what I want to talk about post-Easter. Now, last week was Easter. This week, let's get back in church. Let's walk in newness of life. Listen, he goes on and says, for if we have been, verse 5, planted together in the likeness of his death, that's baptism, we shall also in the we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection living a newness of life living a life of reading the bible living a life of prayer living a life of becoming a disciple going to sunday school learning bible doctrine learning what the bible teaches getting victory in life enjoying life enjoying the peace of god the joy of jesus christ enjoying the abundancy of life this is the newness of life you're not going to get this except being saved and born again. We've been raised to walk in newness of life. That newness of life means we live a life now, not unto self, but unto God. We live unto God. Well, verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus has given you another life if you are a Christian and you are saved and you are to walk and live in the newness of that life. And the newness in that life, part of that is local New Testament church membership and attendance and growth and service. If that is left out of that, that newness of life will never become, it will never become a reality. And you need to make sure you're in the right kind of church that preaches the right kind of Bible, that preaches the right kind of doctrine. And and that look, and and its record and its testimony stands for itself. No one's got to defend it. You know, people can criticize Christians and Christian churches, but how is that individual living? And how is those in whom they are criticizing living? You know, years ago, people may have, you know, right now, somebody I know is dealing with criticism. I said, just give it time. Give it time. Those that are criticized are justified one way or another with time, whether it's true or not. We have been raised to walk in newness of life. The resurrection means that we are made alive from the dead. And before we were saved, we were dead according to the book of Ephesians and sin and trespasses and sin against God. But when we got saved, we got quickened. And the life of Christ came into us. And then we we took it a step further and made a public direct declaration about Christ in us with believers' baptism in a local New Testament church, an organized church, a church with authority, a church that's got doctrine, a church that's got structure, a church that's doing the work that the Bible tells it, tells it to do. Now, I want to say this before we conclude. All of this means nothing if you've not been saved. If you've not been born again, now there are some that'll teach you, well, if you've been baptized, your sins have been washed away and you're good. No, 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 no. They do not get that from a Bible chapter or a verse in the Bible. No, friend, nobody can be saved by baptism. We are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. 
We are justified by his shed blood, which was sinless, which has life in it. And we are saved by acknowledging our transgression unto God and knowing that Jesus Christ is the one who pays for our sin transgression. He is the one who stands up and pleads between you and God. And he is the one whom God will pardon you with if Jesus is in your life. If you have Jesus, you have pardon and forgiveness. If you do not have Jesus, you do not have pardon and forgive us forgiveness. So today, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come in your heart, if you believe that he died for your sin, was buried, and on the third day rose again, and you believe that God, uh, the Father, is your creator, and you've sinned against him, and you need forgiveness, you can call upon him right now, and he'll save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can experience the newness of life, and then walk in it. Walk in it. Continue on in Jesus' name. On behalf of Bible Baptist Church, our time is up, friend. God bless you, and may God bless America.